Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 82 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of November 15th to 21st, so happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and I'll be for the next mm, almost half hour uh, being your renter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, please email me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around, around there somewhere during the course of the show a few times, and you can get the email address at the website. The one thing I ask is that if you email me to please include something like the left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that so that I know it's not spam. Okay. All right, with those necessary introductions out of the way, let's get to it. The first thing is I'm going to go back to something I talked about last week. Last week I was talking some about global warming. Uh, and I've discovered that I'm going to have to revisit the issue this week. Two reasons. One is there's some new stuff that just came out in the last, uh, last little while. And the other thing is that last week I pointed to clear evidence that the world is warming, but it turns out that that may not be the issue I have to address. Uh, according to a survey by the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press, 67%, uh, two-thirds of Americans now agree that there is clear evidence that the world is warming. Uh, that number has increased over the past few years. It's actually 10 percentage points higher than it was in uh, 2009. However, only 42% say that the world is warming due largely to human activity, uh, human activity such as burning fossil fuels. In fact, one in five are still clinging to the fantasy that this is all natural, it's all the sun or something. Um, and more importantly, around that 42% now, that's actually up eight percentage points over about 2010. But uh, Pew also reports in this same survey that Americans are still closely divided on the question of whether or not scientists agree that the warming is mostly due to human activity. 45% say scientists do agree on this, 43% say that they don't. And more importantly, that figure, that 45% that say scientists do agree, is down by 14 percentage points since 2006. Now, the point is, that what this means is that the corporate funded right-wing BS machine has been doing its job. Uh, now that machine can't continue to actually deny global warming. The evidence is just too strong, although it does try to nibble around the edges about how fast the warming is occurring and how much it will be. But it can't, it can't doubt global warming. But what it can do is cast doubt on the source of global warming. Oh, no, 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 it's all natural. It's all the sun or clouds or cosmic rays or, or something. Um, and more importantly, this, this machine could keep hammering on the, on the theme, scientists do not agree. So in other words, their message is, it's nothing to do with us, which really means it's nothing to do with them, so the corporations don't actually have to do anything. All right, well. Do scientists agree or disagree on this question? Well, here's a, here's a chart for you. Uh, these figures come from 2009, but the evidence for human global warming, human-caused global warming, has only increased since then. But even in 2009, uh, among scientists in any field who publish original research in peer-reviewed scientific journals, of that group, 89% agree in a human cause for global warming. Now, that's scientists in any field. Publishing climatologists, people who actually study the climate, among them that figure jumps to about eight, 98 or 99 percent. So yes, scientists do agree we human beings are screwing with the climate. Now, why do they agree? Well, here's one specific. Here's another, here's another graph for you. The big claim, again, is that it's all natural. It's all, especially, you still see this bandied about on comment threads uh, around the web, that it's all the sun. That's what it is, just natural changes in the sun. Well, this, this graph, it shows actual recorded temperatures in the blue line. The red line is measured solar irradiance. That is how much energy the sun is actually giving off. Now, you'll notice that in the past, 
there was, uh, there was a time you could say that there was a rough equivalence between solar irradiance and observed temperatures. But that connection was broken by the late 1970s. In fact, solar irradiance has been dropping since about 1985, while temperatures actually accelerated their upward climb. All right, that's one reason. Here's another reason. Scientists of all stripes often rely on models. Now, models are a way of mathematically describing a process, and you can use them to understand that process um, and to predict the future behavior of that process. The way you test a model is by comparing the results it produces to actual already measured observed data. Uh, in the case of global warming, that would be things like sea levels and temperature records and so on. The closer the match is between what the model produces and uh, your actual data, the more confidence you can have in what that model says about the future of that process. There is no model of climate change that comes even close to producing the already observed data, which does not include a significant impact as the result of human activity. That's why scientists agree, because that's what the facts tell them. We are screwing with the climate, period. All right, now what does that mean for us? Well, in a report issued on November 9th by the National Research Council, this was actually done as the result of a request from the CIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies. Uh, they declared that climate change will create more frequent but unpredictable crises in water supplies, food markets, energy supply change, and public health systems. These crises will place unprecedented strains on American military and intelligence agencies. In other words, they're saying global warming is a national security threat. And by the way, this report, appropriately enough, was released 10 days late because of the disruptions caused by Hurricane Sandy. All right, now, meanwhile, there's a study out of the U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research. This was also released November 9th. And this finds that the climate change models that most accurately predicted humidity were also the ones that were at the upper end of the range of predictions for increases in temperature. These models predict an increase of 7 degrees, maybe more, in Fahrenheit which is about four degrees Celsius increase by the end of the century. Now, I should tell you that the U.S. Center for, uh, U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research, actually, uh, it's a collaborative multi-institution project that grew out of the National Science Foundation all the way back in 1960. They've been around a good while. Now, the thing is, remember what I said last week. Climatologists agree that, and they've long agreed, that to head off the worst effects of global warming, we have to keep the overall temperature increase to below two degrees Celsius. I also told you it's already too late for that. It's already too late to do that. Carbon dioxide, which is released as a result of burning fossil fuels like oil and coal, th it, this is a main driver of global warming. It's a major greenhouse gas. As the result of what we have already done, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is such that even if we were to stop using all fossil fuels today, the temperature is still going to go up for a few more decades. In fact, the planned increases in, uh, in fossil fuel use already will push the temperature well over 2 degrees Celsius. It is too late to head off significant impacts. Now, the point, what are we facing then as the result of this? What are we facing? According to the latest assessments by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, an increase in global temperatures of two degrees Celsius by the end of the century will mean water shortages in already arid areas, more floods in low-lying coastal areas, coastal erosion in small island states, and loss of up to 30% of species of animals and plants. It also means that storms like Sandy will become more frequent, and when they occur, they'll be more severe, more damaging. It also means that the effects on ocean life, for example, um, coral reefs 
and the animals that depend on the coral reefs, and the animals that depend on the animals that depend on the coral reefs. These effects will be severe. Now, if you go beyond that to three degrees of warming, we can add, in addition to that, we can add heat waves across Europe and the Mediterranean, heat waves of the sort that killed thousands of people just a few years ago. We can see heat waves like that becoming the new normal. All right, and now we get to four degrees Celsius, which this latest report is now predicting. Four degrees Celsius, what does that heating mean? Well, again, on top of everything else, with four degrees Celsius, we will begin to see a world that is unrecognizable to us today. The lands where a billion people now live will be underwater. Some major coastal cities will have to be abandoned. Uh, there'll be devastating droughts across Africa and Asia as deserts expand. And in fact, Scandinavia will be the new home for Caribbean style resorts. And if it goes beyond that, what, now what if it goes beyond that? What if that estimate proves to be too low? We have already seen a number of estimates of the amount and the speed of global warming to be too optimistic and that it's already gone beyond that. Well, what if we get to five degrees Celsius increase? At that point, we could start to see and quite possibly would start to see the breakdown of human society. The breakdown of human society under the stress of droughts, floods, water shortages, loss of arable land, uh, disruption of food supplies, the spread of disease as insects and other pests increase their range, and even wars and civil wars over dwindling resources in the face of hundreds of millions of environmental refugees. That is the future we are setting ourselves up for. That is the future that will come as long as we continue to refuse to recognize that we are screwing with the climate. And so it is what we have done and what we are doing that is what's important. It's not the sun, it's not cosmic rays, it's not any of the rest of that nonsense. It's what we've been doing, what we have been doing that's important, and so it's what we will do that will determine the kind of future that we will face. Now, will we do what's necessary? I have my, uh, have my doubts, I really do. Consider this. The International Energy Agency, now this is part of the multi-government organization for cooperation and economic development, known as the OCED. Uh, it issued a report on November 12th saying, and I'm quoting the report here, the global energy map is changing with potentially far-reaching consequences for energy markets and trade. Taking all new developments and policies into account, the world is still failing to put the global energy system on a more sustainable path. The report also noted that fossil fuels received $523 billion in subsidies last year. That's an increase of 30%, and it is six times what renewable technologies get in subsidies worldwide. And the report also projected a 3.6 degree Celsius increase in world temperatures by the end of the century. So what did the media say? How did the media cover this? The Los Angeles Times, for example, it ignored all of that to lead with another of the report's predictions, this one that within five years, the U.S. will pass Saudi Arabia as the world's leading oil producer. The question about a sustainable path was not raised until the 12th paragraph of a 14-paragraph story. And the LA Times was hardly alone. Reuters, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the New York Daily News, Bloomberg, ABC, The Voice of America, CNBC, the Christian Science Monitor, they all led with the story about the U.S. becoming number one as if that was the most important thing for people to know. Interestingly, the only source that I came across that led with what the report thought was significant, which is the lack of a sustainable energy path, the only place that mentioned that was Forbes, the business magazine. We are so very, very screwed. And as a footnote to this, which you might want to consider, might want to call we are screwed redux, I noted earlier that only 42% of Americans believe that humans are responsible for global warming. At the same time, 57% believe in the reality of demonic possession. Two-thirds of goppers believe in the reality of demonic possession. Less than half of them believe that the world is even warming at all. We are really screwed. And we are going to take a break.
and we're back. So now, uh, what first I'm going to do right off the bat is we're going to head to our regular weekly feature now, uh, the Clown Award, given as always for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week's dishonorees are right-wing evangelical Christians, or more exactly and more accurately, their leaders. Uh, after the election, which they lost badly enough that Witless Romney and Paul Ranton were confessed to be shell-shocked, the, the goppers, the Republicans, have been going around trying to find a reason that they lost, which doesn't involve people just not liking them. Well, we have a particularly amusing example of this, because uh, clowns are ultimately supposed to be amusing in their stupidity. Um, particularly amusing example, Brian Brown, he's uh, a chief honcho of the right-wing wacko group, the National Organization for Marriage. He suggested that Whitless lost the election because he didn't focus enough on, here's it coming, same-sex marriage. That if only the campaign, instead of trying to talk about the economy, had gone around the country going, oh my God, the gays, everything would have been peachy. But if you really want to show, I mean, that's enough to win the award. But if you really want to know how deeply twisted this is, in the same conference call where he said that, Brown also said that opponents of same-sex marriage are going to argue in court that Tuesday's election results were evidence that gays and lesbians do not constitute a suspect class, which is the legal term for an identifiable group subject to discrimination. It says they're not a suspect class, and therefore the Defense of Marriage Act should not be overturned. Now, the Defense of Marriage Act is uh, one that denies federal benefits. It, it uh, denies federal benefits to same-sex couples. Basically, refuses to recognize same-sex marriage for all federal purposes, and it has been found unconstitutional exactly on that basis that it's discrimination against gays and lesbians. So here's what Brown is actually saying: same-sex marriage is so unpopular that if the Goppers had concentrated on that, they would have swept to victory in November. But the results of that very same election prove that there is, in his words, a tidal wave of support for same-sex marriage, which means such marriage is so widely accepted that it proves that gays and lesbians are not subject to discrimination, and therefore it's okay to discriminate against them in the case of marriage. And if you understand that, paraphrasing Jeff Foxworthy, you just might be a right-wing evangelical Christian. All right, so what does the National Organization of Marriage plan to do about this tidal wave of support? Brown says the group is looking to punish companies that uh, support same-sex marriage by going after their international business, by going to the countries where these companies operate or hope to operate, and to make their stance on this known in the countries where same-sex marriage is not popular. In fact, in some places in the world, being gay is subject to the death penalty and they want to let this be known. Now, the risk this creates to the safety of the employees of these companies in those other countries apparently is a matter of no concern. But then again, why should it be? Because, you know, all's fair in love and war and all that. And make no mistake, evangelical Christians are in a war for their very survival. I mean, not long ago, taking Fat Robertson, he, not long ago, he said this, and I'm quoting, just like what Nazi Germany did to the Jews, so liberal America is now doing to evangelical Christians. It's no different. It's the same thing. It's happening all over again. It's the Democratic Congress, the liberal-based media, and the homosexuals who want to destroy Christians. Wholesale abuse and discrimination and the worst bigotry directed toward any group in America today. More terrible than anything suffered by any minority in history. So, yes. Being able to deny other people basic human rights is exactly the same as being a victim of the Holocaust. Gotcha. Brian Brown, Pat Robertson, and the rest of you brain-dead, bigoted bozos, you are, all of you, clowns. All right, now from that, we're actually going to go to our other weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Now, next week, I plan on talking about this, uh, this grand bargain that we hear about. But uh, this week, I wanted to mention something else, something else our great deliberative bodies in Washington, D.C. are intending to bring up in the lame duck session. It's called the Independent Agency Regulatory Analysis Act. It's now in the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. 
which is now chaired by the happily outgoing Senator Joe Lyerman. Uh, the committee plans to pass this out of committee and then fast track it. Now fast track it is a legislative process by which you limit amendments to a bill in order to get it passed as quickly as possible. Their hope is to get it passed during the lame duck session before Congress reconvenes in January. Now according to Americans for Financial Reform, this bill would strip the independence from various government regulatory agencies, including, but not limited to, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the FCC, and the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, many government agencies are now required to, by law, or just do on their own, what are called cost-benefit analyses of any new regulation or rule. That analysis is subject, of course, to sometimes lengthy court challenges by corporations that just don't want to be regulated. What this bill would do would be to add at least 13 new resource-intensive analyses of regulatory rules that would have to be done before a rule could be finalized. Agencies would have to submit those analyses to the executive branch for review along with the actual regulations. Now in particular, the proposal is that the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or the OIRA, would get to review both the draft and final versions of any new regulation, rule, or uh, guidance, or directive this procedure would add at least six months of delay to any new regulation. What's more, the OIRA has a long-standing reputation of being hostile to things like environmental or worker safety regulations while being sympathetic to business claims that, oh, these just cost too much, just cost too much. This change alone could create a bottleneck for any environmental, consumer protection, worker safety, or financial regulations. The bottom line here is that the whole point of establishing independent regulatory agencies is to insulate the work of those agencies from direction or influence from whoever happens to be in the White House at the time. Uh, in fact, back in 2009, Susan, Senator Susan Collins, she said exactly that. I'm quoting her. From 2009, if you bring these independent agencies within the regulatory purview of OIRA, you defeat the whole purpose of having them be independent agencies. Yet that is exactly what this bill proposes to do. And to add insult to injury, Susan Collins is a co-sponsor of this bill. Now the capture of our regulatory agencies by those it's supposed to regulate is well known, it's notorious, but the thing is this would make that situation orders of magnitude worse. People are being asked to contact the local offices of, their, of the members of this committee, um, local offices because supposedly those, uh, those calls get more attention than um, calls to the national office. Well, among the members of that committee is our own outgoing senator, Scott Brown. Now, when you call his office, you may want to remind them that if he wants to pursue public office in the future, which I bet he does, then he might want to give a lot of thought to the uh, sort of legacy he is creating as he goes out the door. He should vote against this bill in both committee and on the floor because it is an outrage. All right, I'm going to wrap up with something which is kind of a, a feel-good story. Feel-good story. Uh, uh, well, I should say, as much of a feel-good story as anything relating to victims of uh, Hurricane Sandy can be. Do you know who was among the first organizations to get relief on the ground to victims of Sandy in and around New York City? An organization that was on the ground distributing food and water and blankets and medicine and even some generators, in some cases before the Red Cross or FEMA even got there? A group that within a couple of days had established two distribution centers and by the end of last week had hundreds of relief centers around New York City. You know who that was? It was Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, yep, now working under the name of Occupy Sandy. Uh, Occupy Wall Street has turned the commitment its participants showed, uh, their social media skills, the on-the-fly organizing prowess they developed, and the knowledge of neighborhoods they gained during community organizing that they were doing during the time the mass media thought it all disappeared. It's taken all of that and turned, uh, turned it into a 
valued now, praised and effective relief organization for the victims of the superstorm. ABC News claimed that Occupy Wall Street had become a punchline. I'm afraid that right around New York City now, I don't hear any laughing. In fact, this is a double feel-good story. Uh, Occupy Wall Street also gave birth to something called Strike Debt. This was an organization uh, that published the Debt Resistors Operations Manual. It was to tell people who are drowning under debt about their options, their, their resources, uh, ways that they could help themselves. Now, Strike Debt has a new project. It's called Rolling Jubilee. Now, traditionally, biblically, uh, a jubilee year was a year for the release of prisoners and slaves, for returning land to its former owners, and for the forgiveness of debts. What Rolling Jubilee wants to do is to turn forgiving debts into an ongoing practice. When banks and other creditors have what's called uh, distressed debt, this is debt which is in default and they're having trouble collecting, what they'll do is they'll sell that debt to somebody else for less than its face value, sometimes just pennies on the dollar. Now, this is a, a, a fairly simple, it's a fairly common business transaction. The thing is, usually what the new creditor does is they set about harassing the debtor for the balance of the debt, which to this new creditor is all profit. What Rolling Jubilee wants to do is to use crowdfunding, which is lots of people contributing small amounts of money each, use crowdfunding to raise funds to buy distressed debt, again, for pennies on the dollar, but then instead of trying to collect the debt, to forgive it, to wipe it off the books. Now, this idea has been called simple, it's been called brilliant and powerful, and it's all quite legal. It's all entirely legal. And in a country where in one-third of the states it is still legal to have you sent to prison for failing to pay a debt, and yes, that is true, it is also very necessary. Now, there is one potential hang-up. The banks may not go along with it. Uh, there's an outfit called American Homeowner Preservation. Now, they were buying up pools of bad mortgages and then restructuring them so that the homeowner would be better able to pay them off and so keep their house. The banks hated this idea. They hated the idea of a homeowner being able to keep their home as a result of such a short sale and often asked for affidavits from the new creditor that the former owner would, in fact, be kicked out of their house. Now, American Homeowner Preservation obviously could not give such affidavits since that was contrary to the whole purpose of the organization. So uh, the banks just refused to sell them any mortgages. There's no reason to think that in this case, the banks are going to be any less stubborn, any less unreasonable, any less selfish. But even if that happens, there is one thing that could still come out of it. A lot more people will know just how small-minded, stubborn, unreasonable, and selfish Wall Street really is. All right, that's really it for this week. Now, next week, uh, for you people who are in uh, uh, seeing this on PAC TV, um, you're going to see a repeat of this show. Uh, there won't be a new show next week. For the people watching in Carver, yes, there should be a new show next week. Um, and uh, on that show, uh, in addition to talking about, again, the grand bargain and this insanity, I think I also might tell you some time, spend some time to tell you the story of the first Thanksgiving. And I mean the real story, the story, historically documented story of the first Thanksgiving. And you might be surprised to discover how much of what you learned in school was true and how much of it was complete fantasy. So we'll talk about that next week. For the moment, I'm just going to uh, leave you with this. Just try to have the best week you can. Um, celebrate your family. It is Thanksgiving. That's one of the ideas of it. Celebrate your family. Celebrate those around you, friends and loved ones. And uh, you have the best week you possibly can. And we will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>